Tonight on Nova, Rochester, New York, a fifth prostitute is murdered. Where will the killer strike next? The hairs on the back of my neck start standing up and I said, this is the guy. I just know this is the guy. Cold, clever, and elusive, serial killers terrify us all. Follow the FBI's elite psychological detectives as they race against time to penetrate the mind of a serial killer. David Berkowitz, the son of Sam, shot at least six young lovers in New York City. Albert DeSalvo raped and strangled more than ten women in Boston. And with thirteen grisly murders in North Central England, Peter Sutcliffe became known as the Yorkshire Ripper. Serial killers grip the public's attention and confront our own private dread. They come in all shapes and sizes from every walk of life. They're often intelligent and resourceful. They are not driven by such conventional motives as revenge, greed, jealousy, profit. So they do not respond to such conventional emotions as guilt or remorse. They are, therefore, very difficult to catch. Since 1960, the murder rate in the United States has almost doubled. Now, approximately 55 people are slain each day, and the number of mass, spree, and serial murders, crimes generally committed against total strangers, has increased steadily and alarmingly. Special Agent James Wright supervises the investigative analysis program of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Back in the 1960s, the solution rate for homicide in the United States was over 90%. The solution rate last year was 68%. We're not seeing the type of crime that is committed between two people that know each other. We're getting more and more into to stranger types of crimes. Uh, those are the most baffling types because we don't have a ready pool of suspects and very often we don't have a suspect or we don't have a motive for these crimes, not, a, not an obvious motive. Law enforcement officials across the country must confront the reality of these trends and seek ways to grapple with them. At the FBI's National Academy in Quantico, Virginia, all of the traditional weapons arrayed against crime are taught and practiced. But non-traditional crimes require non-traditional methods. And serial killers, those who kill repeatedly, are perhaps the most terrifying challengers of all. In a suite of offices, two floors below the ground, a small and elite group known as the Investigative Support Unit journeys into the very heart of darkness, into the minds and motivations of serial killers. Over the weekend, we had uh, several uh, cases uh, came in, several of which are serial murder investigations. That have the unit's done. objective in more than a thousand cases each year else, interpret knowledge. behavioral clues left at a crime scene to come up with a personality profile of an unknown and elusive offender. I don't want to let the front office know that they just you know, came up with another body last week. So they've had sure. four killed in the last two weeks. This technique grew out of a pioneering study begun in 1978 of multiple murderers and other violent criminals. Its key contributor was Special Agent John Douglas, now the unit's chief. The interview of the subjects, what they'll tell you is, is the thing that was really appealing to them was the hunt. The hunt and, and trying to look for the vulnerable uh, victim. And once they have that victim, and they have that victim uh, under their uh, control, they feel the strength of the power and, and, and to control the life or destiny uh, of this victim. They believe throughout their life they have been manipulated, they have been dominated, they have been controlled by others. Uh, they have a very, very poor self-esteem. So here, for this one situation now, that was fueled by fantasy, that they can get a victim, they can be in control, 
they can orchestrate whatever they want to do to the, the victim, and they can decide whether or not this victim should live or die or how the victim should die. It's up to them. Douglas and his partner, Robert Ressler, went into the prisons and conducted extensive interviews with the most dangerous criminals to find out what made them tick. Out of the study came a system to understand and classify types of killers and other violent offenders. For the first time, the FBI was able to link what was going on in the perpetrator's mind to the evidence he left at a crime scene. Uh, recently, uh, in Colorado, a 15-year-old girl was deposited off the side of the road. Uh, same signature kind of aspect with uh, the way the body was deposited, uh, the type of ligature strangulation. Um, there are common denominators which you find with each and every one of these people. They come from generally broken homes, they're the product of some type of uh, abuse. And by the time uh, we begin seeing his first kill, he's somewhere in his, uh, in his early 20s. He has a bad track record. He's been a burglar. He's been maybe involved in rape or rape attempts. And he's uh, been extremely uh, uh, hostile and, vi and violent to uh, authority type of figures. The best predictor of future behavior or future violent acting out is a past history of violence. The journey into the mind of the violent offender remains an ongoing quest of discovery. And there are some things that we can use... What is learned is then taught in the FBI Academy's classrooms. Just as an offender leaves fingerprints or other physical evidence at the scene of a crime, the FBI looks for his personality print as well. They're suspicious of others, they're paranoid, they're overly sensitive, hypersensitive to criticism. Investigators are trained to interpret this behavioral evidence to create a profile of the unknown offender. This technique can help police narrow their list of suspects and sometimes suggest active strategies to catch the perpetrator. At this scene, a mildly handicapped teacher was found brutally beaten, raped and strangled on the stair landing of her apartment building. She was attacked in the morning in a high traffic area and was knocked out before being violated. After death, her body was mutilated and displayed in a ritualistic fashion. We've yet to see a case involving this kind of post-mortem mutilation where you had a black man or a Hispanic person. This seems to be the purview of white men and the manner in which they kill these victims. Special Agent Judson Ray brings his experience as a policeman to his profiling work. The fact that this was a mildly crippled victim and also the perpetrator had to render this individual unconscious before he began his activity suggested to us uh, a kind of, uh, of inadequacy on the part of this perpetrator, a person who's not very, very sure, a person who, who perhaps uh, requires being alone a lot, and is not very, very comfortable in the presence of, of, uh, of uh, other people. Uh, the fact that this crime occurred in the daytime, uh, it was a very high-risk maneuver for the offender, suggested to us that this individual had at least a passing familiarity with the apartment building. The fact that this individual was out at this time of the day suggested to us that he was not gainfully employed, that he was probably uh, living in a relationship uh, dependent upon parents or some other significant person in his life. This woman was killed by ligature strangulation and the item used to fashion the ligature was uh, from her purse. This suggested to us that this individual had no plan of killing and probably was not even aware that he was going to come into contact with this individual uh, on this particular day. There was a unique aspect of this crime. The perpetrator took the earrings from the victim's ears and symmetrically placed them equal distance from her head. This indicated to us that this individual perhaps may have been suffering some sort of psychosis, certainly some mental disorder that would allow the police to further narrow the focus on a particular kind of suspect. The police checked local mental hospitals and found one man who had left without permission the day of the murder. His father had once lived in the victim's apartment building and in virtually every other respect, he matched the FBI's profile precisely. He was arrested tried and found guilty of murder. The program began in the late 1970s when we began conducting uh, the research. 
uh, within the FBI, there was still a lot of skeptics. And it really wasn't up, up until about 1982 in the Wayne v. Williams case in Atlanta uh, that uh, we really got a name for ourselves. Uh, we went on site. We did an analysis. We did a profile that described him right down to a T. In 1982, Atlanta was a city under siege. Douglas went to the sites where each of more than 20 black children had been found smothered and strangled. Could this be some type of a, uh, a conspiracy? Could we have multiple offenders involved? Could we uh, be dealing with some type of group, uh, uh, the Ku Klux Klan or, or any other type of uh, group who has hatred towards blacks? Generally, with those types of cases, the crime scenes are very, very symbolic. We didn't see that. Douglas felt a white person prowling these black neighborhoods could not have avoided notice, and that told him something. But he also knew that the choice of victim could tell him even more about the type of murderer. To understand the victim, that requires re-interviewing family members and people who are very, very close to that victim so that we can understand the dynamics that is going on between the violent offender and the victim at the time of the assault. Among certain victims, a common profile emerged. Young, adventuresome males, Curious and inquisitive children, susceptible to a come on or a con from the right person. And that person, Douglas believed, would be a black male in his early 20s, homosexually attracted to the boys and clever enough to gain their trust. Someone this intelligent and manipulative, Douglas surmised, would follow the investigation closely, playing a cat and mouse game with the police. We began saying that anytime someone would talk to the press, uh, medical examiners or police, he would respond to that and, and he would respond by by presenting another body to us and now the, the bodies were found in open view alongside of Rose where he wanted us to find the victims. Then when the medical examiner announced that hair and fiber evidence had been found on some victims, Douglas predicted that the next bodies would show up in the river where the water would wash away most clues. A stakeout was mounted. Wayne B. Williams, a self-styled music promoter and police buff, was apprehended on a bridge over the Chattahoochee River, where another body was soon discovered. Hair and fiber from Williams' home matched samples from 12 of the victims. The only 12 Douglas associates with Wayne Williams. During the trial, Williams appeared sympathetic and believable. So the prosecution turned to Douglas's personality profile in an effort to convict him. What I suggested to the prosecutors was to do a this is your life story. I wanted to infringe upon his body space. I wanted the prosecutor to get in between the jurors and Wayne Williams. And I wanted to be very methodical and very, very low in his speaking voice. And at one point I want you to say, what was it like, Wayne? What was it like, Wayne, when you wrapped your fingers around one of the victim's throats? Did you panic? Did you panic? And Williams said, no. But then he, he caught himself and he went into a rage and, a, and screaming and yelling and he started saying, I know you've got that FBI profile over there, but you're not going to get me to fit that profile. Atlanta is just one example of how a single person can leave a trail of human devastation in his wake. FBI believes there is hardly a major jurisdiction in the United States that has not been traumatized by serial killers. When the bodies of two prostitutes turned up in Rochester, New York, it didn't create much of a stir. It was a routine investigation for Captain Lynn Johnston and his officers and detectives. It started very quietly. Police were, were concerned, but there's a certain number of homicides with prostitutes that happen every year because of the nature of their business, because of their involvements with drugs. It's not unusual to have two bodies or maybe three bodies of homicide related with prostitutes a year. It started in March 1988 with the shooting death of Nicola Gerson. And these were spread out. They were not only in the city, they were in the county. There were little methods of, uh, were different. One was apparently asphyxiated. The other one was uh, shot. So there didn't seem to be a clear-cut pattern going on at that time. 
It was another six months before the next victim turned up. Authorities and then there came a time in which a skeletized body was found down in the River Gorge. Couldn't find out who she was. It was real hard to start an investigation at that point, not even knowing who the victim was. Another one shows up down at the gorge, another skeletized body. And then there was another prostitute that ended up dead behind the YMCA. Um, it seemed to be a little cluster going. Patricia Ives was young and pretty, and the fourth victim found in Rochester's scenic Genesee River Gorge. And when Patty Ives was found, the police were really concerned for this reason. They had four bodies down there, and whether they're related or not at that point, some there are some similarities, and, and they were concerned that if it, if it wasn't a serial, at least somebody was doing more than one of these killings. The investigators searched for links between the cases, sifting the scant evidence for any lead. You run through your files of uh, people that have been involved in sex-type murders before. We're looking at our cases again to make sure we didn't overlook anything. We're looking for commonalities between our cases and go over everything with a fine-tooth comb. You picture in your own mind what, what a person could look like, but you, you really can't. The bodies were badly decomposed and offered virtually nothing in the way of forensic clues. And then, a fifth body was discovered in the River Gorge. The importance of this one is that uh, she was reasonably uh, fresh uh, compared to the other ones which were uh, either decomposed or been dead for quite some time and uh, there wasn't anything that we could have done with them uh, for any type of evidence. Officer Robert Garland had been the crime scene technician in each of the prostitute killings. We found our way down the hill down here, and, uh, and it's so steep here, we had to call the fire department, and they used ropes to uh, put her in a basket, and we had to drag her up here. And we were very, very hopeful that we would get some uh, physical evidence off the body. Unfortunately, we uh, had uh, totally negative results. Anxiety has area prostitutes drawing their own conclusions. One of the rumors on the streets is it's a John who caught AIDS and now he's striking back. Maybe the guy feel like this here. He don't know which one of the girls burned. So he just taking them out one by one. When bodies started to come at a little more rapid rate, we brought in some people from Quantico, Virginia, with the FBI, to look at these cases for us, at the behavior and to look at it as, as outsiders that uh, could sit back you know, a little more calmly, think about it a little more rationally, and, and paint us a picture, if you will, of, of, of who our offender might be. Freeze, that's the eye. Get your hands up. Right there. Now don't move. Don't move. The case came to Special Agent Greg McCrary, in whose territory Rochester fell. Highly trained in traditional investigative techniques, McCrary had also spent years disciplining his mind and body through the oriental martial art of Shirinji Kempo. It's a, a case uh, involving a series of homicides in Rochester, New York over uh, the last couple of years. Uh, At the investigative support unit's morning conference, he reported the facts to his colleagues. Basically what we're dealing with, we've got a series of crimes where the, the victims were We told Captain Johnson that we needed the investigative file, or at least a summary of the investigation. We needed the crime scene photos. We needed victimology, and that is as much about each of these victims as they could tell us. Because we had to look at these crimes from the offender's perspective, in the order that the offender had uh, encountered these victims and committed the crimes. And that would give us the pattern, that would allow us to see changes, patterns in the activity of the offender. Next one, which I believe to be the first in the series to be related here, is th deals with a white uh, female prostitute named Dorothy Blackburn. Many of the victims you're going to see are right, right downtown in the River Gorge area. The similarity here, though, deals with the uh, dumping the body in water, uh, th and that we're going to see time and again as we go through here. Did he, uh, did he weight her down in the water? No. These areas are not the areas where, where they would go to uh, the prostitutes. Where we're, where we're finding these no, victims, right? No, no, it's not. Yeah. Obviously, the offender's got a car. They would not walk with the guy. They, you know, he, they're getting in a car with him. 
Has there been a lot of publicity here? Has this been connected in the media? Every day. Every day. Every day. Every so. day. Uh, yeah, I think there definitely is a, a serial killer working here. He's a white male. Uh, probably the victims are white, predominantly white. I think the ones that are related uh, certainly are white. We have a core, a core group here of uh, homicides I feel are related. Uh, he is very comfortable on the street with his victims. Doesn't appear out of place, uh, uh, you know, in that, uh, in that environment. As McCrary followed the unfolding case, Rochester police stepped up their patrols and surveillance. Detective Leonard Borriello was one of the key investigators. During uh, the period that uh, the girls were being found dead, uh, our tactical unit was strategically placed around the entire area, observing prostitutes, just watching them, not arresting them, and taking down the plate numbers of vehicles that they would get into. We asked the girls to call us and report any, anything out of the ordinary, uh, any kinky individuals they might happen across. It would be just out of the ordinary. One of the uh, prostitutes working in the area, these victims had disappeared, had come forward to the police with information about a, a trick or a John who wanted her to, to play dead. And that he, matter of fact, was uh, suffering or experiencing erectile insufficiency prior to that. Uh, and then only when she played dead was he uh, able to be sexually aroused and gratified. Uh, we couldn't say that that's your guy, but we, what we said is that's the type of thing, that's the type of behavior that we expect your offender uh, t to show. He was real nervous, and that made me nervous. And I, I carry a knife to protect myself, and I do know how to use it. So I just let him know point blank that I had a weapon and that I was nervous that there was a serial killer. The only time he was really abusive to me is, you know, when I asked him, you know, why was it taking, I had been there like 40 minutes. That's when he really said, well, if you just play dead, bitch, we'll get this over in a few minutes. You know, and little things kept clicking, you know, and I, the hairs on the back of my neck started standing up, and I said, this is the guy. I just know this is the guy. It's becoming a familiar scene for Rochesterians city police, the medical examiner, and a female body found hidden in a remote area. The body, described as a fairly heavy-set white female, was discovered by a man walking his dog around 11 o'clock this morning. Police think there is a chance it might be linked to the other bodies recently found. Thanksgiving day. Very cold day. Very, very cold day. And uh, the medical examiner comes and uh, we process the scene and we find out that the, the body had been eviscerated and been cut from the neck to the vagina area and uh, we're concerned, very concerned. Uh, everybody there, uh, yeah, they're, they're low, real low and uh, spirits are cold and Thanksgiving day, another day away from the family and uh, we don't know what, what this individual is up to. He seems to be escalating in the type of activity he's doing. We still have no idea who he is. June Stott was the tenth victim found. The first who was not a prostitute, and the first whose body the killer had mutilated after death. When her body was found uh, late in November, that, uh, I think for the police, for the investigators, was a, a low point. They just really felt they uh, were looking into the abyss at this point, and it was a very dark time. Uh, from our uh, point of view, as paradoxical as it may sound, that was good. That was good news uh, for us because we had more behavior to work with, more behavior to analyze. June Stott is also the first victim where we have uh, an effort at the post-mortem evisceration. And the question is, is this, is this part of the same set? Uh, is this another offender working? Is this the same offender now who has is living out his fantasy more and is becoming more involved with these bodies as, as time goes on. Do we have in this case pretty much the same modus operandi as far as we know as with the other cases that, that you think are connected? Or do we see a 
we're, we're seeing a big change in behavior, but is there also a lot of uh, consistent behavior? Yeah, there is. I think there's a, there's a lot of consistent behavior. My feeling is that this is this is part of the same series. Uh, I think we've got an offender that's spending more and more time with these victims. It's an uh, evolution on his it, right, part. Right, he's acting out his fantasy now. Maybe he's wanted to do this before. He just hasn't had the time or felt comfortable enough to do it. He's now now spending time, the same type of victim. Uh, I think we'll see with the victims after this that he that this post type of post-mortem mutilation will continue. If this mm. is part of acting out his fantasy, fantasy becoming reality, he's going to continue continue to do this sort of thing with the victims. McCrary went to Rochester in early December and reported his conclusions to the investigation team. Do you think he's still going to go for the same type of individuals like the prostitutes? Yes, yeah, he's targeting uh, vulnerable victims. Uh, he, he's not adequate enough individual to go after a more difficult target. Uh, these are Our initial analysis after a couple days of going through the cases led us to believe that this would be a lone uh, white male. The age would be 30-ish. The victims were late 20s or so. We felt that he'd be just a little bit older perhaps than the, the uh, victims. The crime scenes themselves reflected an individual who did not panic. The rage was controlled. These were methodical, uh, predatory kind of kills that generally indicate a criminally experienced, a more mature type of offender. We felt he would be uh, familiar with the Rochester area, be familiar with the River Gorge area, could be a fisherman, a hunter. The dump sites and things that he were choosing would be areas he'd be comfortable and familiar with. He'd be a functional individual, he'd be, he's employable, but the employment would be at a menial level. He's not a person who has a lot of interpersonal skills, does not interact with, with people. Uh, in depth uh, in any way. He's superficially, he'd be fine. He'd, he'd be uh, okay to get along with and okay guy to have a, a beer in the bar with and it'd be no real problem that way with the guy. Certainly he was driving, he had access to a car and a car again would reflect the personality. This would be a functional kind of a vehicle, no, no brand new car, not a sports car, nothing like that. That's how he would dress, that would be his demeanor, his clothing overall, a functional kind of guy. And that, uh, that we talked to the Rochester police, they were stopping people they thought looked suspicious, stopping transvestites, they had a, a, a case they stopped a guy driving a van, he dressed up as a woman, so we said, that's not your guy, that's not who you're looking for. This offender may appear almost transparent to the officers on the street, they're looking right through him. There's a lot of panic among the, uh, the prostitutes, a lot of concern, yet he still has no trouble obtaining victims. They get in the car with him. Why do they get in the car with him? Because they don't think he looks like the guy. They don't think he's the guy. Greg, what you're telling us is, is that this guy is probably going to kill again. Yes, yeah, he will kill again. He's been successfully getting the victims to leave with him, no problem, uh, and he'll continue that as long as, as he feels comfortable doing that. Discovered by a deer hunter. McCrary's prediction proved correct. The pattern of killing continued with Elizabeth Gibson, another prostitute. Because prostitutes live such a dangerous and vulnerable lifestyle, they're among the most common victims of serial murderers. And it is emotionally tempting for many of us to feel secure in our distance and detachment. But through their studies, the FBI has shown that many serial killers begin with the most vulnerable of us, children. Christine Jessup was nine years old when she was murdered in the small Canadian town of Durham. John Douglas knew he had to fully understand this child before he could describe her killer. Christine uh, Jessup case was an interesting case uh, of this uh, young child who was abducted apparently from uh, her residence or on the way to her residence and uh, she was about nine or ten uh, years of age and, and uh, they would later find her three months later her skeletonized remains uh, about thirty miles away what was interesting is right away the press and the, the mayor and the community the chief of police everyone is saying uh, watch out for the stranger don't take any candy from strangers and I said uh, this is not a stranger I said this killer lives in this community in fact this killer knew Christine Jessup 
Uh, this little child, just that day, got a recorder, a flute from school, from her music class. And she was real excited about that. When she got home that day, uh, her mother and father were not there, nor her brother. And she was excited. She wanted to show this to someone. It was my understanding. What I felt was, was occurring. So what she did was, is she, I believe, is she sought someone out in the neighborhood, someone who would appreciate what she is learning in music class. So this person, whoever that person is, is probably your killer. So lo and behold, when they finally came up with a suspect in the community, he played the clarinet, and he was in a uh, music uh, class. And then he developed some type of a ruse or con to get her away from the residence and to take her to an area where he felt comfortable. And when they found her skeletonized body, there was that recorder lying next to her body. In the grim ledger of crime detection, this is a success story, and an important one, because studies show that many killers who begin with children gain confidence and skill and move on to more challenging adults. The man who is going to become a serial killer before that first sexual murder already has a fantasy scene in his mind. It has its origins in things that really happened to him, things he imagined happened to him, things he's Dr. Park Dietz, a forensic psychiatrist, has spent his career studying these men, trying to learn what drives them to their heinous acts. They often make mistakes in the early offenses that they learn from and try to ensure they don't make in later offenses. They often choose more vulnerable victims for the early offenses, such as younger people or people who are physically frail. Uh, whereas later they become emboldened and take on more powerful people. And so there are some patterns about uh, how their crimes progress over time. But what is always the case for sexual serial killers is that the fantasy exists before the action. A striking number will have tortured animals in some extraordinary way or will have been very cruel to children, tying the neighbor to a tree and tormenting the child and inflicting various harm on the child. Uh, something that sets them apart from other children, which is an expression of their early aggression and which shows that they're already thinking in adult-like ways about doing terrible things. Intrinsic and environmental... Dr. Dorothy Lewis, a psychiatrist at Bellevue Hospital, has authored many studies on the links between childhood violence and adult crime. Uh, what... Uh, most of the extraordinarily violent children, adolescents, adults uh, have in common seems to be a vulnerability to impulsivity, to paranoid misperceptions, to uh, distorting uh, what is around them, but also a history of having been severely physically abused, severely, often severely sexually abused, uh, often raised in an extremely violent household. And uh, again, uh, from a psychodynamic point of view, you create a very, very angry uh, child, and yet very few of these kids ever attack the person who has abused them. In fact, many of them don't remember it, put it out of their heads, but they displace a lot of this rage onto other people in their environment, so that the neuropsychiatric problems alone don't make you violent. Probably the environmental uh, factors in and of themselves don't make you a very violent person. When you put them together, you create a very dangerous character. Research has shown there is no psychological formula for creating a serial killer. Ted Bundy grew up handsome and well-educated, charming to those around him and killed at least 23 women from Washington State to Florida. Others come from different backgrounds. David Burke was known as the son of Sam in, uh, in New York City. Uh, he was the product of, uh, of an adopted family. He never knew about this. Uh, he would later learn about this uh, after he got out of the military. And by the way, he, he uh, had no sexual relationships with any females throughout his life until he went to Korea and lo and behold, he contracts VD. So it adds further hostility to women. He goes back to New York to look for his mother, and he finds his mother and his sister in Long Beach, Long Island, and much to his surprise, they don't want a thing to do with him at all. So at that point in time, 
he blossoms. He blossoms as a serial killer. So he procures a weapon, a 44 caliber weapon, a very strong, powerful weapon. So he goes to areas where the victims, are, his potential victims are parked in lovers' lanes. What's very, very interesting is he goes, rather than go to the driver's side, which is the threat, it's the nail part, he shifts around the car and he goes to the passenger side, So, which is telling you as he's firing into that vehicle in the police uh, type of stance that his hatred, his anger is directed at the woman. The male is simply in the wrong place at the wrong time. And what he, he told us, which was, which was very, very interesting, is that he's on the hunt nightly, like so many of these guys. And when they cannot find the victim, the victim of opportunity, the victim who's going to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, they go back to the areas where they've been successful in the past. They go back to the crime scene areas. They go back to the disposal areas, and they symbolically roll in the dirt and relive that fantasy over and over again. The gruesome discovery was made this morning on Meg Street. A man pulled out his trailer to go on a hunting trip and found the body. Police say it was covered up, apparently by leaves. Not only did Captain Johnston have 11 homicides to contend with, how the woman died. more prostitutes were missing. There are three missing white women from Rochester, Darlene Trippy, Maria Welch. But now, based on the profile emerging from the evidence, McCrary offered Rochester police a strategy to catch the killer. We had missing prostitutes who we felt were potential victims of the offender. We know that June Stott had been subjected to a post-mortem mutilation. We know it's not uncommon for this type of offender to have uh, sex uh, with uh, with uh, some of their victims w once they're dead, uh, we felt that that may be occurring. Uh, so we felt that he, you know, he was being drawn back to these sites. So if the police could locate one of these dump sites and not tell, and then surveil that for a period of time uh, after they found it, they may well uh, find this offender returning returning to that site. With three missing women presumably dead, the profile indicated the killer would be drawn back to the bodies. So McCrary's strategy lay in finding at least one and then waiting and watching. We've been searching in Western Monroe County for several days, concentrating along water, ditches, and along roadways where some of the bodies had been found. The pilots had been up several times and were starting to be convinced that the body was not in the area that we were searching. There came a time during the search that we made a decision to fly from Northampton Park back towards the city of Rochester along Route 31. While flying along Route 31, we finally saw a body. The body was that of June Cicero, widely known as the most streetwise prostitute in the area. If she could fall victim to the killer, no one was safe. I was back at Quantico when I got in a call that the New York State Police helicopter had uh, flown over and uh, found a body in uh, the Salmon Creek uh, area, which was the same creek that the, uh, one of the first victims, Dorothy Blackburn, had been dumped in, and that there was an individual parked uh, there on the roadside uh, uh, right above, adjacent to the body. As soon as the helicopter appeared, they could, they could see Right underneath him, about 15 feet down, was a body. The car was right on top. The, the man swung his legs in, in, to, into the car. He was on the passenger side. This particular individual had fled when they'd seen the New York State Police helicopter. They had their, their patrol units converge on the area that he went in, located him, identified him. It was uh, some contained excitement on my part. You're, you're always hopeful that, that it's worked, that you've got the guy, but uh, you're not sure. And we found out that the individual that they saw on top of the bridge was an, a person known to us now as Arthur Shawcross. McCrary's tactic had paid off. The killer had returned to sexually mutilate another of his victims. Police followed Arthur Shawcross to nearby Spencerport. They stopped him at the nursing home where his girlfriend, Clara Neal, worked. He was taken to state police barracks where he was interviewed by Inspector Dennis Blythe. He was very calm. When I talked with him, Art, uh, I asked him, do you, know why we, do you know why we stopped you? And, and why we want to talk to you? And 
Well, I assume it's because I don't have a driver's license. And he was very cool and very calm. So I asked him, are, you know, I'd like, you've been very cooperative. You know, I, geez, I'd really like to take your picture. Um, well, why do you want to do that? Well, I, I just know you want to cooperate. Oh, okay, fine. And so at that point, I just had him, had him stand up against the wall. And I asked him, smile. And he let me take his picture. We then took this picture and put it in with five other photographs. They showed me like six pictures in a little composite thing. And they told me, oh, take your time. I said, I don't have to take my time. This was the guy. It was him, you know, it was him. Joanne Van Nostrand not only identified Shawcross as the man who had picked her up, but also as the one Elizabeth Gibson had been riding with the night she was murdered. We felt that this type of offender would need to be confronted with evidence that uh, he would not uh, confess uh, unless he uh, felt uh, strongly that there was some evidence that linked him to the crime, uh, that this was a mature offender, a more experienced uh, offender, and that uh, he would need to be convinced uh, that we knew what he had done and, and were able to prove it. We had a lot of ammunition to question him about regarding the first case that we talked to him about, which was Elizabeth Gibson, uh, which was supplied by Miss Van Ostrand. And I think it was 28 minutes before we got the first confession. It was probably the longest 28 minutes I've ever gone through. I mean, we were both very nervous because we knew we had the killer, but we wanted a confession so badly. You have to know when that moment is, they're at the top and they're ready to go over. And what brought it, him over the top was, we, we started talking to him about his girlfriend, Clara. And I told him, and, and the whole time I'm, I'm patting him on the leg, I says, I would hate to think that Clara's involved in this. And he put his head down and he said, no, Clara's not involved in this. And at that point, you know you've got him. Yeah. I think he probably loved Clara enough not to get her in trouble for something he was responsible for. And his wife Rose. Because he knew he did him, and he thought we could prove, definitely prove, that Clara's car was at the scene of the crime. So he wasn't going to leave her hanging on a limb. And he also gave himself a reason and a defense right. for killing Elizabeth Gibson by stating she started scratching his eyes and digging at his eyes. And then he also stated that he put his forearm under her chin and throat area and may have pressed down a little bit too hard because of Ex his eyes. Accidentally. Accidentally killing her. And then he said he tried to give her mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation and crying because he felt so badly that she had died, which I doubt very, very much. No. And as he put it, why did he kill these girls taking care of business? And that's exactly what he said, taking care of business. No. No. Well, no remorse whatsoever. No. Very calm, very easy going. A friendly somebody. He never said nothing out of the way to anybody to get you nervous or upset or nothing. Sources tell Eyewitness News that Shawcross worked here at G&G &G Food Service on Main Street for about a year. His boss says he was quiet, kept to himself, and a good worker. But he also said he wasn't aware Shawcross had a prison record. Arthur Shawcross's troubles with the law began in 1969. He was convicted of burglary and arson in Watertown, a small community north of Syracuse. Less than a year later, he was arrested again and admitted killing a young boy and girl in his hometown. Both were strangled and the girl was sexually molested. Shawcross served 15 of a 25-year sentence. He won an early parole after the parole board denied his freedom eight times. Shawcross ended up in Binghamton, where he stayed only two months. An angry community mounted a campaign against him, and Shawcross was relocated to Rochester. A year after his arrival, the killing began again. As soon as the suspect was in custody, the FBI began assessing its profile. Arthur Shawcross was a calm, nondescript person, easy to overlook, who did live and work in the city in a regular but menial job. He was an avid hunter and fisherman who was friendly and personable on a superficial level. He liked to drive for long periods in an ordinary, functional car. He did return to spend time with the bodies of his victims and to mutilate the later ones to fulfill his own inner desires. But the profile was wrong. 
on one important count. The area where we were uh, uh, most errant here in this thing was with the age uh, of the offender. We felt he was late 20s, early 30s. What happened was, uh, he, w he was of course 45, the difference being that he had been in prison for that 15 year period. And that really is, is simply like putting him on pause or putting him on hold for a 15 year period. So when he, when he was released 15 years later, he really picked up just where he left off. He told us altogether 11 women that he had killed. There may possibly be more. We'll probably never know that. He also told us that he would bring us out, which he did, and show us physically where he had dumped two bodies that hadn't been located yet. And we asked him, take us the way you took them. And he took us street by street, and he remembered every detail of the streets. And we've got the flashlight, we're going like this, trying to find her, and we can't find her. So we go back and, all right, come on, where is she? She's right there. Come on, take, show us. Where is she, Art? And he takes a flashlight and right at our feet, and there she is, face up. The water was a About six inches under the water. And it never bothered him. Darlene Trippi would be the last victim of Arthur Shawcross. The next day, he was arraigned in Rochester City Court and charged with murder. The task of leading the prosecution fell to First Assistant District Attorney Charles Siragusa. Shawcross did not deny the murders, but claimed he was insane at the time and therefore not responsible for his actions. After all, what else could compel a person to commit such horrible acts? If not insanity, then what? In New York State, in order for a defendant to prove to a jury uh, that they're insane, and the burden of proof in New York is on the defendant, he's got to prove to the jury one of two things. Either that at the time he committed the homicide or homicides, uh, he didn't know the nature or consequences of his actions, that is, he didn't know what he was doing, or he has to prove to a jury that he didn't know what he was doing was wrong. If a defendant can prove either of those two things, then the jury would, would be bound to, to found, find him insane. For retrospect, it signaled the beginning of a nightmare that haunted this community for 21 months. The most damning evidence will come from the defendant's own mouth. Rather than a medical diagnosis, insanity is a legal concept upon which psychiatrists are asked to give opinions. The defense chose Dr. Dorothy Lewis to present its claim. It isn't a powerful cue in that it doesn't tell a person what to say. What Dr. Lewis was trying to convey to the jury, based on her opinion, was the fact that Arthur Shawcross, because of what she referred to as post-traumatic stress syndrome with extreme episodes of dissociation and because of organic damage that she diagnosed as complex partial seizures was not responsible when he killed uh, any of the ten women for which he was accused in Monroe County. Toward that end, she attempted to convince the jury through the use of videotapes in which he supposedly hypnotized Shawcross that he had undergone in his youth severe sexual and physical abuse at the hands of his mother. Oh. Mm. Why can't she walk, Barney? I can't get up. Why can't you get up, Barney? Mm. Why? My back hurts. He was in a, uh, a peculiar state at the time that he committed his act, so that uh, I think there's a good question regarding whether he uh, really knew what he was doing at the time that he was doing it. I knew from... Uh, from materials that his attorneys had sent me, that he had a cyst in the anterior part of his temporal lobe. That kind of uh, damage could certainly uh, produce episodes of intense feeling and uh, possibly episodes of, of extreme violence for which memory would be clouded or impaired or absent. The prosecution called on Dr. Park Dietz, who also examined Shawcross. You failed to realize what I said earlier? No, I saw you use a jet knife on one. Yeah, I remember that. And I saw on the other. And there's only two of them. There wasn't any other time you used a hacksaw? 
<coughs> Why are you trying to get me mad? None of the serial killers that I've had occasion to study or examine have been legally insane, but none has been normal either. They've all been people who have got mental disorders, but despite their mental disorders, which have to do with their sexual interests and their character, they've been people who knew what they were doing, knew what they were doing was wrong, but chose to do it anyway because this for them was the ultimate sexual experience. The fact that Shawcross made sure that um, no one was around when he killed any of the victims, again, is, is indicative that he knew what he was doing. The fact that during this period of time when the killings were going on, he was able to hold down a job and without any apparently um, malfunctioning in his work. He was able to carry on a relationship not only with his wife, uh, but with uh, Clara Neal. I think are all factors, apart from the psychiatric evidence, that speak to an individual who knew exactly what he was doing. Cold, calculating, and remorseless, for whom killing was not an emotional disturbance, but in the defendant's own words, business as usual. The trial lasted more than five weeks. The jury deliberated less than one day. The verdict, guilty of murder in the second degree on all charges. The sentence, 250 years to life in the state penitentiary. The conviction of Arthur Shawcross raises a final question about such vicious killers. What to do with them? After all, Shawcross, like many other serial killers, had already murdered two children. We've seen many cases where these people have been put into prison, they've served their term, they've been quote-unquote rehabilitated, put back out into society many years later, and they continue doing the same thing. And we truly believe that, that rehabilitation uh, is, if not impossible, it's, it's extremely difficult. And we really believe that society has to be protected from these people. I think that it does very bad things for our society if we become uh, a mindless kind of uh, group of people who doesn't care why someone did what he did uh, and thinks only in terms of punishing the individual or of doing away with him. Uh, I think that uh, if we're going to be a humane society, we have to protect ourselves, but we also have to understand what made these people the way they are and then... Uh, I would say work very hard to try to prevent creating more people like that. What I have to feel, what my people have to feel, we have to put our, ourselves in the shoes of the victims. So what I, what I flash back to is a victim who's screaming, who's begging, begging for the life. And I have tapes here, I have tapes of, of victims who are being murdered, who are regressing in their behavior, calling out for their mommies, calling out for their daddies, and begging and please God, please don't kill me, but they kill them. And so when I see the day uh, of execution and the, the little vigils outside of the penitentiary you know i may for a second there maybe feel sorry but then i want to pull out the, the file jacket of these guys i want to look at those crime scene photographs i want to look at that autopsy protocol and look at those autopsy uh, photographs and i want to see the interviews and uh, of the of the victims and, and the families and put myself back into that victim so i have no sympathy uh, no sympathy at all for these uh, these people. The cases that come to us are certainly the worst of the worst. We see what some human beings have the capability of doing to their fellow human beings, and it it almost defies uh, description. It's not pleasant work. It's not pleasant material that we deal with on a daily basis, but uh, it is something that I think we all get some satisfaction out of and, and we have to, to take that personal satisfaction for everything we can get from it. Law enforcement officials must grapple with the new realities of their work. Brutal, senseless acts committed against seemingly random strangers have come to characterize a particular evil of our age. Serial killers are, by definition, successful killers who learn from their own experiences as they go on to increasingly more gruesome crimes. It can only be hoped that the men and women who study and hunt them down Let's go, 
are learning even faster.